Okay, so this is a more traditional PowerPoint type thing. So we are, um, I am going to have a lot of time for a discussion at the end, but I just, that we, I have a lot of maps to show, so I kind of need the PowerPoint to help me along here. So um, my name's Inga Lapuma. I'm the technical lead at Lamfire, um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Lamfire products, and then I'm going to go into how important Lamfire is to all aspects of the cohesive strategy. So that's the plan. So a lot of you know about Lamfire. Some of you have um, forgotten about Lamfire. <laughs> and um, some of you have never heard of Lamfire. So I, I just want to give you a little bit of a background. We are focused on mapping vegetation and fuels across the United States. Um, we, were, um, we were established from this need to have a consistent national inventory of vegetation and fuels. And so here's kind of a little timeline. It, the prototype started back in 2002. Um, we were chartered by the, you know, Wildland Fire Leadership Council in, what was it, 2004. So um, WIFLIC started all of this, <laughs> essentially. And, um, and we've been doing updates and um, having what we call our base map, so the first base map in 2009, and then we just had the 2016 remap, which is another base map, and those are created with a certain methodology involving Landsat imagery, so our, our NASA people are helpful with that. And then we also have um, regular updates, and the updates are to account for um, changes in fuels on the landscape through time. The updates are also based on what we call our rule sets, and so um, expert-driven rule sets saying how vegetation and fuels change with different types of disturbance. So these are all of our layers. All of these are standalone, right? So you don't need um, you, you don't need to uh, use just the fuels, you can use any of these layers, right? And, um, and the key point here is that we actually have to assign a classification to each 30 meters on the land, right? So whether it's urban, roads, agriculture, and all of the natural fuels um, across the United States. And it's uh, Alaska, Hawaii, all the islands as well. So. Um, the key thing I want to talk about here is that the interrelationship of all of these layers. Like, we can't map fuels if we don't know what the vegetation is. We can't map vegetation if we can't somehow figure out where the disturbance was the year before um, and, and, I'll, and plot data, right? We need vegetation plot data to train our models, our mapping models. So I'm just going to go through a few of those different sections um, of, of what we offer. This is our Landfire data distribution site. It's available for everyone. All of our data is available for free to everyone. Um, this is showing our events geodatabase. So every year we put out a call um, to gather treatments, and that includes prescribed fire, it includes any kind of mechanical treatment. Um, even insect and disease uh, changes to the fuels. And so here you can see, you know, we're over by Tallahassee. I just clicked on one of those polygons and I found out that we got th this polygon from FACS, which is one of the federal reporting systems. It's a prescribed fire. It tells me what date it was, okay? so. We have this data, and one of, the, one of my frustrations is that a lot of people don't know that we have this data, and they go out and try to gather it themselves and recompile it themselves. So I really encourage everyone to at least check this out, and um, you can see when you put it all together, it's quite extensive. So this is just showing 2017 through 2020, all of the polygons that we gather for the United States. And it's, it's a lot of data. 
So we use that, we use that to understand what type of disturbance happened. And we um, put it into our raster data layer where we also add in the remote sensing of disturbance. And we have people going through and, and, and confirming, yes, this happened here, you know, based on looking at the imagery and Landsat data. So we have our annual disturbance layers, which go from 1999 to, um, we're working on 2022 right now. Um, but each of the pixels in the United States, this is from um, 2020, has information on where, uh, where it was, obviously, but, oh, sorry, go back. Um, the, where it was, what year it occurred, what the source of that disturbance was, um, and then sort of our confidence in that source, right? Um, and that's based on, on different sources. So we, we do incorporate, oh my God, sorry, I keep doing that. Ah, here we go. We incorporate the monitoring trends and burn severity and all the national um, fire mapping programs. We incorporate all those events. We incorporate our own remote, remote sensing of disturbance for private lands, right? Nobody reports that, so we have to kind of get that information somewhere. And here's showing um, our, our historical disturbance, which is an aggregation of the 10 years um, of, of annual disturbance. And here's an indication of where the plots are that we use. Um, and, and these are, you know, FIA data, um, BLM AIM, and all of the big national programs that gather vegetation plot data. And um, you can see, like, the different um, eras so that we use for the original map and then for our 2016 remap. Um, to train our models to understand what is the vegetation at that point and how can we extrapolate that across the landscape. And so one of the, um, the things that people don't realize, I think, is that uh, land fire maps really detailed vegetation classifications. And so we have two different ones that we map. One is the ecological systems classification and Essentially, seven, over 700 natural vegetation classes are, are mapped. And then we also have, I think, one of the only NVC uh, maps and, um, available for the United States. That one is based on the group level of NVC, and it's about, got about 400 classes. Um, so for various purposes, people did need different vegetation classifications. Um, but I just want to give you an idea of what that looks like. This is about 10% of the ecological system classes. And so, you know, it's just really detailed. And it's really helpful for habitat um, as well as for translating to, to fuels. So here's, a, you know, the entire United States ecological systems. You can't really tell what's going on, but you can easily zoom in. And we do have, you know, I just zoomed in on the northern Maine there, but you can see the detail of, of the vegetation classes. And you can do, anyone can go to our, our website and zoom in to wherever they want. And so um, before we go into some of our structural variables, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, mapping is a science of its own, you know? And we, um, we use our plot data, we use LIDAR data, and we use that to train what's called the regression classification models, which is basically a machine learning model. And we train it on um, the imagery, and so once, once you have that relationship, you can you can use that to extrapolate with the imagery. And so it's really important for us to have actual plot data and actual LIDAR data in order to, to be able to do that. So here's a map of our um, existing vegetation cover. So we have percent cover for every pixel. And you can see some of the detail of that and that existing vegetation height, same kind of thing. We have it for um, three different life forms, so the herbs, shrubs, and trees, and you can see the 
the orange, the brown, and the green. And this is kind of our <laughs> poster child for land fire, right? So we, um, we map fire behavior fuel models. So the Scott and Bergen 40 fuel, mo fuel models that indicate surface fuels. Um, and, it, and it gives you an idea of the rate of spread and the flame length for a particular type of vegetation. And it's used in almost every fire behavior model that I can think of. So I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. We also have the um, fuel characteristic classification system, which um, is a different uh, way to classify fuels based on strata and fuel loading. And that's really important for a lot of the smoke modeling that you see out there. Um, and I, I believe we're the only one that maps that as well. Um, we have seasonally adjusted fuels uh, for the Great Basin, and that's our Modfis product. And so we put that out in, in the spring, summer, and fall, and it really gives you an idea of how um, the herbaceous layers changing um, based on seasonal weather. And so that's really helpful for fire planners in that area. So I highlighted the ones that I just talked about, but just to remind her that there's a lot more um, to land fire than what I just talked about and that they're all related. <laughs> um, but now I want to get into how is land fire used within the cohesive strategy. And um, about 11 years after that first prototype, this paper came out which essentially says land fire has been institutionalized as the primary data source for modeling activities aimed at meeting the goals of the cohesive strategy. And I think <clears throat> being institutionalized can have its pros and cons, right? <laughs> so, um, so I think it's, it's obviously used widely in a lot of ways, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I think it also makes it a little less, um, it makes it harder to maintain and improve. It's almost like prescribed fire, right? Like <laughs> you want to get it out there, but then you want to maintain and improve it as well. And so um, this is kind of how I look at the three pillars of the cohesive strategy um, from that spatial perspective. So the first one being what's the situation? What's the spatial context and the relative risk? The second one being, what can I actually do about it, um, the local conditions at community level? And then finally, for the response, it's like, who can help me uh, you know, as I go through this process? So what's the situation? Well, here's your August complex from 2020 in California, over a million acres in the end. Um, just crazy, crazy amounts of fire. Um, but over here, we have our... Um, our events uh, layer that shows the polygon that was from NIFC, if you know that acronym. Um, and then we have our severity, which was from the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity um, program. But it's, it's in context with all of the other little things that are happening around, as, as well as other larger events happening around it. So just having that context of, of what's happening on the landscape around you. And then, and then land fire will take, you know, what the, the vegetation cover was before. It will use the severity. You can see in the high severity areas, there's um, more reduction of vegetation cover. So we keep that updated um, for that spatial context. Um, and then, again, for the fuels layer. So this is the uh, FBFM 40 fuel models. And again, you can see in the, in the um, more severe, severe areas the reduction of fuel. And, and the reason that this is important is when you enact a new fire behavior model um, on this landscape, for example, if a fire starts up in this area, now when it hits, you know, when it hits the old disturbances, it's going to change the fire behavior in the model, right? So this data is feeding those fire behavior models, and so it needs to stay updated. And so I think a lot of people have seen um, the, the risk, uh, wildfire risk data, um, 
how we organize that in, in wildfire. And land fire is really focused on that left-hand side, the likelihood and the intensity, um, and to calculate the hazard on the landscape. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the products that use land fire to get to risk. And so this is how it works. So you take the land fire fuels and topography, you feed it into the fire behavior models, you get your burn probability and flame length. That gives you an idea of likelihood and intensity, which gives you the hazard. And so you see the likelihood and intensity at the bottom. And that, um, oops, I wanted to go back to that. And that, that plays into this model here for wildfire risk. I guess I shouldn't have gone back. <laughs> there we go. Um, and so the idea here is we provide the important layers, which here you can see I've, 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 um, I've zoomed in. These are what we call the land, land fire landscape layers. And so it has the surface fuel models, the canopy layers, so canopy base height, canopy bulk density, and the topography, all of the stuff that's needed to run fire behavior model along with other things, but this is what I'm focusing on. <laughs> all right, and so that is these eight layers here. All right, and remember, <laughs> you need all the other stuff to get to that point. All right, so here is the um, example of the Wildfire Risk to Communities website. I'm from New Jersey. I always look at New Jersey first. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a great way to understand your relative risk compared to other areas. So if you look at the entire United States, so this is produced by the U.S. Forest Service. Again, using land fire la layers to run those um, fire behavior models to get the hazard part of that risk equation. We have the southeast wrap and the, and the more recent northeast wildfire risk assessment, um, again, using the FSIM fire behavior model um, to get to the risk. And then I've just taken from Pyrologix, which is one of our super users, I've taken a bunch of examples from them. Um, this is the old Oregon one. <laughs> the, the new one that they sent back was also based on FSIM and land fire data. Um, but here's the California and then other regions that they've also done. So it's kind of all over the place. Now, um, the, uh, there are many tools um, that can use this risk data. IFTDIS is one, so this is the Interagency Fuel Treatment Decision Support System. This is all online, so if you wanted to run uh, fire behavior for your area and estimate risk for your area, you could do that. And this is more based on some, you know, the project in the unit kind of um, focal area. Um, there's going to be a talk about IFTDIS <laughs> tomorrow if you want more information about that. Um, but I, I used IFTDIS before I, you know, um, even came to Lamfire, and so anyone can use it. And so here you see you can choose what Landfire version you want to use to run your model within IFTDIS. And it's all online, so you don't have to download a fire behavior model or anything like that. Other applications, um, we heard from our insurance partners over there. Um, we have um, insurance people that use our data for their own kind of proprietary wildfire risk modeling um, to calculate lost costs. Um, a lot of us have heard about the first street effort that looked at parcel data. Um, and then we have a lot of academic users that have their own wildfire um, risk or behavior models that use land fire data. And so before I go on, I wanted to ask the audience, um, how many of you knew that land fire was the driving data for um, these wildfire risk assessments. Yes, okay, good. <laughs> That's good news, that's good news. All right, so um, I'm gonna move on to sort of the local applications. Um, so 
in order to do the community wildfire protection plans, you need some estimate of risk, right, for your local area. And this is just an example um, from Colorado, one fire protection district that um, has, you know, this many CWPPs. They used um, some uh, a, a local like flam map for their fire behavior um, to get an understanding of their risk. And there's a lot of CWPPs. This map only shows Western CWPPs. They are across the entire United States. Um, but if you think about each one of these, you know, needs land fire data to create their CWPP. FEMA recently put out a document that you know, um, suggests using land fire data for your um, CWPPs. Getting down to the neighborhood level, you know. Um, here, this FireWise community in Bolivia, North Carolina, they use the Southeast Wildfire Risk Assessment to do their FireWise assessment. And, you know, you start to think of, okay, well, if my house is here, <laughs> you know, I might want to do a little bit more home hardening and put gravel out five feet from my house. It's a little more likely that it's going to affect me than, you know, over in here somewhere. So, you know, it you can, you know, we used to always say, oh, don't look at your favorite pixel. But like your backyard, right? My favorite pixel is my backyard. I always look at my backyard in Lampfire. Um, but... You can, and I think we're at the point now where you can look at this level of, um, this is a neighborhood, right? So you can look at that level of land fire data and get some information. And here's an, a map of all the firewise communities across the United States. And so finally we get to response, and I know that we're kind of trying to expand a little bit from that. Um, focal area, but it's it's still an important um, aspect to how land fire gets used. So, um, WIFDIS is one of what we call our super users of wildland fire decision support system. Um, it's typically used on large incidents, and um, in order to decide where to, uh, you know, post resources and and how to basically op operationalize the, 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 um, the incident. And so um, it's also helpful, you know, for fire behavior analysts and long-term analysts to provide information to um, the IC, for example. And, and to do that, they use lots of different models, but all of them use Lamfire as their, you know, foundation. And so why, why are land fire fuels used? And I think there's sort of a little backstory to that. Um, originally, when land fire fuels were develop, developed, they went around the entire country and they got input from everyone. Um, and we still do uh, calibrations, uh, local calibrations for fuels to understand, like, is, it, is this actually going to burn the way we think it's going to burn? And so... Um, we use also similar models uh, to check our inputs against actual uh, fires. So if we have a fire and we say, okay, well, you know, when we model this fire, is it going the same way that the fire actually went, right? So we check our data and make sure that it's, it's working well for these fire behavior models. Um, again, we incorporate that local input as we go. Um, the changes in disturbance and you know, changes in fuels due to disturbance are accounted for, and we're getting better and better at that. So um, <laughs> we're um, getting uh, less latency in our products. Um, and then we actually provide some tools. If you do say, hey, you know, that, that's not right, you can flip it. And, um, and, and we have the Landfire Total Fuels Change tool to adjust our fuels if, with local knowledge. And then we, you know, I mean, I think one of the key things is that we always say, oh, well, we were talking yesterday, like, oh, we don't want everyone to come and descend and tell people how to do things. But when you have a fire behavior analyst or um, on a fire, they know they have land fire data because it's everywhere, 
right? And so they know how it works and they know um, that they can basically rely on it. Yeah, they want to get local input and make sure they have everything correct, but the basis is there for them and they know that when they come to a large fire. Other things um, that are important, we ta we've been talking a little bit about pods in the last um, talk, the potential operational delineation. And I, th I keep thinking that land fire is kind of like the Kevin Bacon thing. So <laughs> um, you can find land fire in pretty much all of these products. You know, if you go back far, I think there's five degrees of separation here. But, um, um, you know, we feed into the all of these products and, and the suppression difficulty index and the termination of those potential control lines. Um, and, you know, obviously before that final decision is made, you have the stakeholder input. But, um, but again, you know, we have that, that foundation, foundational data. And then recently I learned that, um, oops, I learned that um, the new snag hazard map that's available um, goes through, you know, back through um, up to land fire data because the tree map um, that basically has uh, mapped FIA, the forest inventory and analysis plots across the United States, um, used land fire um, in their imputation of that data set. So you, you can find it if you look. <laughs> land fire is part of the fire shed. Um, implementation. Um, it's part of the um, the 3D fuels imp implementation for wildfire because that uses the tree map. So I'm trying to think of any other buzzwords that we've been taught heard, heard about lately. But um, land fire is involved in almost every um, aspect of of these plant pre pre work planning as well. And so here's a map of the suppression difficulty index um, across the United States that's used for pods. And so I think um, I think I've fairly made the point that land fire is <laughs> is important to a lot of different efforts in the cohesive strategy. And so um, I guess what I what I wanted want to ask is that. Um, Folks communicate that, you know, I think that that's an important part of maintaining improving land fire data through time. So what is our plan? What, what are we doing in the land fire program? Um, well, we've gotten to annual releases. So our next um, set of releases is going to start in the spring of next year. And it's the first time we're going to be accounting for disturbances that happened in the year before. So we'll basically be current, <laughs> OK? And so this is the first time we're getting to that point. And you have to understand, we're getting the disturbances submitted in October, and we've got to go through all the mapping of all those 30 layers or whatever by the spring. And it's, so it's going to be an incremental release. So we're going to start, obviously, in the west and move our way east. Um, but it will, it will be the first time that we're doing that, and we're very excited that, that that's happening. Um, and then we are, you know, working on moving towards, instead of the rule set based updates that were, you know, kind of expert informed, and um, we're trying to move more towards that imagery based update like we did for our base maps. Um, so that makes it a little more responsive to site conditions. Um, you know, and interacting disturbances because the imagery will reflect that. And so that'll help us um, model disturbances better. And then we're moving a lot of our processes to the cloud, like LIDAR processing, <laughs> for example, which is it, anyone that worked with LIDAR, you know, it's crazy. It's a lot of data. Um, so these are some of our plans. And um, I just want to kind of keep this up here for a little while 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 we talk so we do have our YouTube channel our newsletter our Twitter and our um, website there so if you wanted to get 
more information on that. And the Nature Conservancy is um, really uh, our communications arm, I would say, and our training arm. And they also help with a lot of our historic fire regime data. I'll come back to this. We also have an office hour that you could come to every month, which is usually just a great discussion. And I'm usually on them if you want to talk to me. And I just need to acknowledge all of these folks. Um, I always say I have five bosses. So, <laughs> so I have um, Department of Interior, Forest Service, USGS, and then um, my contracting <laughs> person, and then also Jim Smith from TNC, um, you know, all contribute to kind of where my focus is. Um, and I also need to thank the New Jersey Forest Fire Service because um, they're the ones that taught me about fire management <laughs> to begin with and actually getting out there and seeing some fire behavior. Um, so I need to thank them for that. Um, and then there's my contact date, um, data there. But I'm going to go back to that one just so you guys can get it if you want it. Um, but what I wanted to do in terms of our discussion was um, think about land fire and, and how, what are the challenges that you're facing with the three different pillars of the cohesive strategy? So landscape level, local level, and then um, response. And the challenges you're facing that could potentially link back to that land fire data, right, um, that you're looking at. And, and then any other questions that you have about land fire, um, I'm happy to address. But first of all, let's start with like landscape level, like that, those, the, the wildfire risk um, kind of situation where all of that data coming at you with the, with the hazard um, mapping. What are some of the challenges that you all have faced in, in using or looking at that data and, and what might some of those challenges, how, how might those link back to the data that's feeding those models? Can, can anyone, yeah, address that? Michelle's jumping in for me. <laughs> Thanks, um, Michelle Steinberg with the NFPA. Um, one of the things I observe, I don't actually have a criticism, I have praise okay. for the wildfire risk to communities piece, which I realized I did a short column about it in our NFPA journal shortly after it came out because I realized it was a basically it, uh, a request from Congress that that be stood up in about 18 months, which it was, and knowing that took a long time to develop, but um, it is a very good tool for the public to start to get it, to start to understand. And I think the social vulnerability element of it was an incredibly great add-on. I know that you're, you're working with fuels and, and other pieces. Right. I think the, um, the, I won't say shortcoming, the thing that's missing, and this is not necessarily something you're going to do, is structures. I'm going to keep harping on structures. And then that example you gave of a fireway site looking at that, all they're looking at is the vegetative fuel. They're right. not looking at the structures as fuel, and we know that in an actual scenario, the wildfire now becomes an urban conflagration when it hits the structures that are fuel. Um, so the, the structure to structure. And I've addressed this with others. It's been acknowledged. We know that's a, we know that's a gap, but I know that, for example, the insurance industry, as you mentioned, has parcel data, has structure data, that will that will get developed by others, and that's not you know problematic. But I did have just the experience of I put a blog, I put a column out, I put a blog out saying, "Isn't this great that that we're able to do this?" And I actually had Firewise uh, you know advocates, spark plugs out there saying, oh, "Our community is the 98th percentile at risk in uh, Colorado." And I said, "Yes, that's why you're doing Firewise." So right, right, you know, right. making that connection that for connection. people. Yeah. And just a final clarification. Uh, the Firewise map you showed is actually stood up by NFPA. It okay. is simply a point data to right. show where communities participate. So right. we aren't actively using it, but I think there's a very good connection in educating the public and getting that first visual for them of what is the risk. So I just wanted to offer that. Not really criticism. I think it's a fantastic move forward, and I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm 
I'm sort of waiting for someone to give us um, fuel models for homes and businesses, <laughs> right? Because I'll throw it in there <laughs> if you give it to me. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long, you know, kind of. We've been having this discussion, right? Fires don't stop um, at the end of the natural vegetation, and you know, we've done our best to include as much of that vegetation as possible. Um, you know, we've we've incorporated the Microsoft building footprint into Lamb Fire um, to really try to um, get that detail of where the homes are, but we don't have a way to say this home is going to burn like this, you know, and then or this home is going the rate of spread from this home to this home is going to be this, right? So that's that's definitely a gap. Yeah. Hi, uh, Sachi Sabaratnam with UC Cooperative Extension in Sonoma County. Um, so I think uh, part part of that uh, um, is you know the work that you all are doing with Firewise and the Wildfire Prepared Home designation. I think is also really helpful in bringing communities together on that. So um, that aside, and then uh, just uh, some fire departments use just kind of the slash um, model to approximate structures for that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not what I raised my head for. <laughs> that was just ancillary. Um, so what the, I think the, the challenge is, particularly in Sonoma County, is um, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of data and we have even finer scaled vegetation data. Um, and it's very, it, it's, it's difficult to present the data in a way that people can really understand what the trade-offs are, how to you know, consider different management scenarios. Um, and uh, if you just present the density of fuels and the risk, um, there's a concern that, okay, well, so then, you know, does that mean you're clear cutting? Does that mean that you're, you know, uh, you know what, 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 does that, what does that imply? And so I think that the challenge is really taking that data and using it to communicate um, what different possible scenarios are and really be able to kind of take, go from, you know, from, from data to a plan, what's in between that is, is determining kind of what the community values are and the community tolerance for change and the speed of change. And, and who's going to be doing that? Is it on private land? Is it on public land? All that. So um, I don't know that you have an answer for that, but that's really, um, I'm, I'm doing my, my, that's my master's thesis topic is um, how visualization can be used to catalyze community consensus around wildfire veg management. So that's, I think the, the, that's the, the big challenge is how do you use this to you know, to, to do kind of the process that um, they were talking about earlier in, in Stanislaus, to have that community conversation um, in a way that people can, can get their hands around. Yeah, I mean, I always say a picture is worth a thousand words, but a map is worth a million. I mean, it's, you know, if you, if you can utilize this data to tell your story, I think that's the, the huge advantage of having um, all of the spatial data. I mean, I'm a GIS fire geek, you know, so I love, I love it. But, um, oh, I had this map up here, you know, just as like every map is a masterpiece of visual storytelling. If you can show them, like we saw in the last um, presentation, this is what it is before the treatments, this is what it is after the treatments, you know, and there are tools to do that now. Um, so I, I really feel like, you know, maps are your friend. <laughs> you know, I, I'll never forget in New Jersey when I was mapping the fire history of New Jersey um, for the last 100 years um, during my dissertation, I, I would show a map to folks and they'd be like, uh, that's where my house was. And it showed that I had burned two or three times in the last 100 years. That's impactful, you know, if you can say to someone, yeah, you're in a dangerous area, you know, and you should probably consider that. Um, just at the, you know, within the township, you know, is this kind of that, that level of communication, I think, is, is really impactful. Definitely. Wesley Skeeto, North Carolina Forest Service, uh, echoing from the NFPA the, the kudos on, on the data. We use it in all of our community assessments. We use it to prioritize uh, grant funds, you know, where, what's going where. Um, the, the one nitpick 
you know, you asked for feedback earlier. The yeah. community protection zones, I'm not sure if it's a south ramp feature or coming from your end. Uh, the community protection zones, you kind of have a lot of times one wide swath of pink and then a little secondary around the edge. If there was a way to, to further subdivide that, give a little, little more area of emphasis. Uh, but my main question is, uh, recently I read an article out of Oregon where the wildfire risk came out and there was tremendous pushback. You know, yeah. I understand, as does everybody in this room, that topography is topography, vegetation is vegetation, it's just data. Uh, but the concern over devaluing property and insurance and all the, you know, the knee-jerk reaction that occurred out there. Uh, have y'all had any discussions internal about if you have challenges to the data? You know, I know most of that is education, you know, saying, folks, this is what this is. This is its intended, intended use. Uh, but do you see any, any challenges coming your way? Uh, for the, the source of the data, things like that. You know, I'm I'm a little I'm fortunate in that I have a bit of a buffer from the, the political side of it, right? So I'm working mostly on the data, but um, there, I know I know there are lots of things that can improve about land fire. I you know, and I know that there are things that we can incorporate. Um, for example, like seasonal agriculture flammability, right? We don't have that right now, um, you know, or wetlands uh, areas that that are, are flammable at some points of the year, like South Florida, you know. So there, there are definitely improvements that we can make to the data. We can incorporate more LIDAR. And here's a request from me to whoever is, uh, you know, comprehensive LIDAR across the country every year, you know, that would help us <laughs> better map um, the structural aspects of fuel. But yeah, I don't, you know, I, like I said, I have that a little bit of a buffer, but it, it concerns me when people, you know, are, are worried about how their area is rated because it does lead back to our data, you know. And so it's something that we all think about. How can we improve it? How can we make it so that it makes sense to people? Yeah. Uh, when idle again, embedded with NGA for the FireGuard team. Um, you mentioned that you get disturbance data. Uh, I think you were bringing it in in October and then providing updates in the, uh, in the spring. Um, how, how old is your oldest data if, if for example, the FireGuard team is saying, okay, we're looking at your data, we have a confidence that the oldest data that we might be looking at is X months, years old. If, you know, some, sometimes their concern is, uh, are, is that a burn scar? Are we looking at something else? And right. how old is this data? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, for our fuels adjustments, you know, we, we account for the last 10 years, and that may not be enough, right? So, um, but, um, but we have annual disturbance layers on their own, like each year back to 1999. So, you know, you could compare that to what we have, what you're seeing to what we have and see if we, we mapped it as well, right? But yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, the fact that we do only account for the last 10 years in our vegetation and fuels, that can be improved, right? Some areas don't recover for 20, 30, 50 years. Um, so it's it's just how you map it and how you incorporate those those changes. Anything else? One more question. Hi, Amber Hi. Soya, NASA Langley, um, or NASA headquarters right now. So um, my question is, uh, well, I have so many questions, <laughs> and <laughs> they're probably um, more detailed that we can answer later. But when I'm looking at all this, it, this actually kind of ties to the last question. I am wondering the difference between, and I do applaud you. I mean, this is amazing data. I use it all the time. Um, and I understand how complicated this must be, especially because you choose to be correct, which okay. is different than <laughs> nobody looking at it, don't, not knowing what kind of disturbance it is, just saying, assuming it's something. Right. So, so thank you. Um, so in terms of LIDAR data use, um, what 
what are you using now? I understand that you couldn't use something that is totally contiguous, like a Jedi, because it's not going to come back, and it would take too long. So that's that's a question. Um, do you use it? Um, could you use it for a one time? Um, what LIDAR data do you use? Um, and if it's not contiguous, why wouldn't you want to use a contiguous one time? Um, and that so that's the the height structure. So when we when I see a remap, what does go into that that's new in terms of lidar and in terms of vegetation growth, mm -hmm. like the things that grow every year? Um, I've heard you say ten years. I is that a model? Is no, I mean just in terms of how how far back we go um, to adjust the fuels. But yeah, for for lidar for remap. We did sample LIDAR at one hectare um, where we had it and used those um, data to train our models. Um, we do have plans to not sample in the future and just use what we have for every pixel where it's available. Um, we are looking at JEDI right now. So um, post-disturbance data and training data is almost impossible to come by. Um, and JEDI is probably one of our only sources for that. Um, so that's um, something that we're looking at right now for our, our more image-based updates that we're moving into in the future. Um, and, and yeah, we could do one time and just kind of have that model relationship and apply it to, to future imagery. Um, but um, it would be cool also if we... <laughs> Can continue to have Jedi, <laughs> or you know that um, repeat lidar measurements. The post disturbance stuff is really important. It, it's it's an, it's almost impossible possible to model post disturbance without some sort of training data, and we just don't have a lot of that. We have FIA plots. We have you know um, kind of those monitoring plots, but there's not a lot of monitoring plots. Um, after disturbances and through time after disturbance, like how is it recovering, right? And that's the kind of stuff that we need to be able to map to get the fuels right, so. Good morning, Tyre Hofeltz with Idaho Department of Lands. Uh, a question related to what you're just talking about is the Forest Service and the DOI many years ago went to the extraordinary effort of putting together a model called the V D, D, T, C model. And excuse me, I do not remember what each letter of that represents, but it is out there and it does exactly what you're talking about is it shows change over time in vegetation and how, how could we implement that into the disturbance data to show us that change over time so that we have a better idea of the returns that occur to the, the state of um, serialness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of coming at it from that imagery perspective in that the satellite imagery is going to help us inform that recovery through time. Um, and and our, our models, you know, I'm trying to think, I think, I feel like we did have some relationship with the VDDT originally, and then our rules came out of that. Um, so, so I think we did build upon that um, in our history. There's a long history for land fires, so it's hard to know everything that went into it. But yeah, so I do feel like we did build upon that um, for our rule sets and what we use to update our, our vegetation and fuels now. But yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways that you can look at it. Um, we're looking at space for time, right? Like, how how can we predict how things are going to recover? Um, and and there's different ways to look at it. So we're trying to explore all options. 